Doings of Doyle is sponsored by Belanger Books, home of the best Sherlock Holmes anthologies featuring today's top Sherlockian authors. Belanger Books is the only authorised publisher of Solar Ponds Mysteries, continuing the Sherlock Holmes legacy into the 21st century. Visit them today at belangerbooks.com. Welcome to Doings of Doyle, a podcast dedicated to the works of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Professor Challenger, Brigadier Gerard, and of course, Sherlock Holmes. I'm Mark Jones. And I'm Paul Chapman. And together we'll be exploring Doyle's eclectic bibliography to understand more about the great man's life and work. We'll be discussing his fiction and non-fiction, the well-known and the obscure. And stopping by Baker Street along the way. You can find out more at doingsofdoyle.com or follow us at doingsofdoyle on Twitter. Hello and welcome to episode 33. Today, Paul and I are delighted to welcome to the podcast multi-award winning crime novelist and celebrated commentator on crime and detective fiction, Martin Edwards. As well as being a successful author, Martin is president of the Detection Club, archivist of the Crime Writers Association and series consultant to the British Library's Crime Classics. His non-fiction work includes How Done It, a masterclass in crime writing by members of the Detection Club, The Golden Age of Murder, and The Life of Crime, a monumental new history of the genre which came out earlier this year. He is then, somewhat unsurprisingly, winner of the Crime Writers Association's Diamond Dagger Award for his significant contribution to crime writing. So who better to talk to about Conan Doyle and detective fiction? Martin, welcome to the podcast. Well, thanks very much. I'm delighted to be taking part and talking to you today. Martin, we've known each other since the... uh... The, the 1990s when I used to yeah. write for the much lamented Sherlock magazine yes. and obviously crime fiction and detective fiction are the center of your your cultural universe yes. what was it that drew you to to this sort of fiction in in the first place well it was a couple of things really uh, Paul uh, I think that the the spark came when I discovered Agatha Christie at the mm. tender age of eight and I saw a film Murder Most Foul, and um, uh, I was entranced. It's it's not, it's not the greatest <laughs> film in the world, but at the age of eight, uh, I didn't care. Uh, and I liked the idea of the detective and the clues, the suspects, the surprise solution. So so um, I went home and started reading my grandmother's Agatha Christie paperback. <laughs> uh, I started with the murder at the vicarage, and mm-hmm. really from that moment on, I I wanted to. To two things in life, really. First of all, to read as much detective fiction as I possibly could. And secondly, mm-hmm. even then, I wanted to write it. And it was at all about this time that I saw on television in those days the Basil Rathbone uh, Sherlock Holmes uh, films, and I loved them as well. <laughs> And so my, my early uh, ventures into crime writing at the age of 10 was a series, a series of mysteries called the Melwyn Hughes series. <laughs> uh, and this was a kind of mashup of uh, 1960s swinging uh, Britain, as, as I saw it from my little town in Cheshire, uh, mm-hmm. and uh, uh, a mixture of Agatha Christie and Sherlock Holmes. So it was a sort of complete rip off of Conan Doyle and Christie. But uh, I still have those books and they... They have uh, they have very pompous introductions, so that's one habit I've never got out of. And, uh, <laughs> they, uh, they have uh, uh, chapter titles uh, such as uh, a body or exit three people. So I was a very very bloodthirsty <laughs> ten year old. So so really, it, it all stems from those early influences, and Agatha is very much there, and and Arthur Conan Doyle is very much there right from the beginning. Mm. We must kick off really here with with talking about this this fantastic new volume that you've produced, and Paul and I are uh, uh, thoroughly enjoying it at the moment. I'm I'm as far as Ruth Rendell, so don't spoil the ending for me. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I, I, what I was really intrigued by was that you started with the early history of crime fiction and talk about that role of gothic and sensation novels. Mm, yeah. And we've mentioned quite a few of those on the podcast because they influence Conan Doyle, not just in his detective fiction, but wider. Yeah. Tell us a bit more about those gothic and sensation novels and how they came to influence crime writing more broadly. Well, I, I do see them as as very significant, uh, certainly significant on, uh, as far as Conan Doyle was 
concerned as as you say and and enduringly so and mm. and to me the uh the influence spins off in in two different but but vaguely connected directions the the first is towards the supernatural side of things mm. the ghost story mm. uh, and of course we we still love a a good ghost story, especially around Christmas, uh, and and uh, secondly, the the more rational, the mystery uh, with a rational uh, explanation that that spins off into uh, detective fiction and crime fiction, I think, and mm. and with the novels of sensation from the eighteen sixties onwards, uh, uh, particularly with Wilkie Collins, and I think was the, the dominant influence at that time, as well as. Mary Bradman and, and others, but but Collins, I think, was preeminent. And his influence, you see it, and this is one of the points I, I mentioned in the Life of Crime, you, you see it in Gillian Flynn in, in Gone Girl and, and Sharp Objects, you know, the the, uh, the the TV version of Sharp Objects nods to the woman in white. Mm. So so that that influence is, is very significant, very substantial and very long term, I, I, I would say. Mm. And do you think, uh, Martin, as well, you, you talk here about this dichotomy between the, the, the supernatural and the rational. Yeah. And again, one, one of the influence, the great influences on, on Conan Doyle was, was Edgar Allan Poe and, and the, yeah. uh, the, the three Dupin stories. Um, and they have their own dichotomy of, of, of the, 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 the rational, the logical approach of the detective and that the sheer yeah, the, the, Poe's reveling in, in particularly emerges in the Rue Morgue in, in gore. Yes. And this again comes out as a central thing in, in a lot of Conan Doyle's stories. Yes. So do, do you see that also is, is an important driver and, and it drives the genre and drives the popularity of the genre, this, this clash between these two aspects? Oh, oh I do. And, and, and you see it in all kinds of different ways. You, you see it in the the doppelganger stories of you know mm. Jack and Hyde, Stevenson, and, and all the others. Uh, Helen McCloy, the American writer of the the forties, again she was very keen on mm. doppelganger stories. That that kind of thing. But but Poe's influence was was really very very uh, significant, I think, in terms of detective fiction. Mm. Uh, Dorothy L. Sayers said that. Uh, if if you add into the three Dupin stories, the uh, uh, story of the gold bug with ciphers, mm. thou art the man with the least likely person, you've got <laughs> in five short stories, you've got the template for thousands mm. of crime uh, short stories and novels that have been, been written since. And and I do think that that uh, Poe's dark imagination um, was very inspirational. Uh, to many writers, and and certainly, I, th- I think Conan Doyle took took mm. a lot from him. Even even if Sherlock is a little bit dismissive uh, in those yeah. uh, early pages, but uh, I I, th- I think that's uh, that's a permissible author's tongue in cheek joke <laughs> uh, rather than uh, genuine disparagement. And coming on to to Sherlock Holmes, then on the back of mm. of of Poe, I mean, what does what was new about Sherlock Holmes? I mean, it, it, we 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 often draw the connections back to Dupin, but yeah. there the, there must have been something substantially new or different. Or was this just a case of Conan Doyle being sort of right place, right time? Oh, I I, I think there were things that were different and um, uh, enabled Sherlock to break through as a character. I, I, I think that, that one of the things Conan Doyle was very interested in was what he saw as fair play. And he felt that the crime story of those days would uh, uh, culminate in a solution sometimes coming out of left field. Uh, and the, the reader was, was just bewildered by it. I, I think, of course, but those stories have, have very often disappeared now. But mm-hmm. but that that was what was prevalent at the time in his mind. So taking uh, the the example of of Joseph Bell, I, I think what he was trying to do was to show the chain of reasoning by which Sherlock arrived at his conclusions. Mm-hmm. His brilliant, breathtaking uh, deductions, the Hound of the Baskervilles being a uh, a classic uh, example, but of course there are many, many more, and and I think that that uh, uh, idea of fair play, which which was later developed and in some ways transformed in the golden age, but mm. uh, uh, I, I think that it was important 
to him. But it was fair play, not in the sense of giving the reader a chance to solve the mystery, which is what we get from the Golden Age of Christie and, and the rest of them, but it, it was in justifying the great detective's brilliant conclusions. Mm. So I think that that was uh, a, a breakthrough. And the scientific uh, heft, if you like, that uh, uh, through Doyle's uh, medical training and knowledge mm. of expertise, he, he was able to uh, come up with authentic, uh, material, plot material, which gave the story strength. So, so I think that that mm. is part of it. I also think that that the character uh, uh, of of Sherlock and and importantly the character of Watson, mm. uh, I think these are very crucial elements because it mm. uh, again and again in fiction you, you come down to the people. Uh, so, so I think that. Dupin is this brilliant remote reasoning machine, and, and, and we have that with Sherlock, although he's, he's developed much, much, much further uh, and in a much more colourful and memorable way uh, mm. than we have with Dupin. But we also have with the narrator, uh, you know, Dupin had a friend who was a, 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 a narrating the adventures, uh, but he's unnamed and has mm. no, no personality. Of course, with Watson. We have again this dichotomy, this contrast between Watson, the uh, the old soldier, the guys uh, hmm. back from the Afghan ca- campaigns, the guy with the medical training and, and knowledge, but the ordinary man. The hmm. contrast to the brilliant reasoning machine, the cerebral Sherlock, and I think that that was a very major development. It didn't come out of the blue. You know, hmm. uh, Poe had laid the uh, the groundwork. And, and this is this is the way that fiction develops. This is the way that yeah. writers work. You, know, you, you, you don't get things out of nowhere. By and large, they 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 have their seeds, and then you take those seeds and you you grow them into something uh, slightly different. And that that uh, in, in Conan Doyle's case, of course, he grew it into something uh, not only very different but enormously popular as well. Mm. I was really struck by the chapter that you you wrote about. Um... G.K. Chesterton and and the fa- foundation of these sort of fair play rules, <laughs> because I'd never really connected in my own mind how much these fair play rules owed so much to to Conan Doyle and the and the Sherlock Holmes stories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean that, that I think it's fair to say that the Golden Age authors, the, the major figures of the twenties and thirties, were were almost without exception huge admirers. Of mm. Conan Doyle, and of course, he and, and and in particular Sherlock Holmes get referenced constantly in the in the novels, uh, and, and Watson gets plenty of name checks as well. So you see it in Agatha Christie, but you, you see it in Anthony Barclay, you see it in Sayers, you see it in the Chesterton who began earlier before the mm. First World War. Uh, you, you see it all over the place, time and again, and and you see it also in in foreign. Uh, uh, stories that mm. so, some of those, which as far as English speaking readers have only recently been rediscovered, the, uh, the, the Joe Jenkins stories, which yeah. is very much a rip off of Sherlock Holmes in the 20s and 30s <laughs> uh, in Germany, uh, Paul Rosenhaid. So, so, so the influence was very, very uh, profound and it was also widespread. Mm. To, to come to the, uh, the, the foreign writers' point, it, 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 it is. This this aspect of Doyle, which which has fascinated me for quite some time now, is the French influence on yeah. on Doyle. It's just it's it's yeah. enormous. People either don't realise or, or have forgotten that, that that Doyle could read French. He, he was taught his his mother spoke and, and read French. He was taught French at Stonyhurst, and he devoured French novels and, yeah. and the importance of of of, of French writing on, on on particular the Holmes canon is is is. It's just enormous, and and we know um, Terry Hale, the, uh, the, the 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 French literature scholar, and he makes a point that that with um, the uh, Gaboriau novel uh, La Ferle Rouge, that yeah. could translate as a study in Scarlet. Yeah. So the, this this influence is, is is just there all the time, and it, it's it's starting to be studied now. But uh, it, it's it's great that that you actually make a point of mentioning this in the Life of Crime. Yes, yes, I, I was keen to do that. And, and the French writers of the 19th century, you know, the people 
we, yeah, we've we've almost forgotten the likes of Paul Feval, uh, mm. but, but but they they were very very big in their day, and then of course there was Vidoc, the the uh, Pochettin mm. gamekeeper, yeah. mm. uh, mm. and and then as, as you rightly say, uh, Gaborio, and and uh, of course he too gets referenced right at the start of yes. uh, <laughs> Scarlet. So mm. so that influence again is is very present and very significant, and of course it goes on into the. Uh, early years, at least, of the 20th century with uh, Gaston Leroux and yes, the yes. list of the Ella Room, which uh, influenced uh, the later writers, such as Christian John Dixon Carr. But certainly at one time, the mystery of the Ella Room was John Dixon Carr's favourite favorite crime novel. So, mm. uh, so that French influence, which, as you rightly say, has been, has been uh, very much underrated, uh, over the years is is actually pretty significant and and yeah. and, and you mentioned the, uh, uh, the 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 name of Terry Hale the uh, I think he produced that anthology didn't he many years ago of of French detective stories mm. which has some some fascinating stories in it which I I devoured at the time <laughs> and and I referred to when when I was writing the uh, the book it's it's a terrific anthology and mm. uh, uh, it certainly deserves to be uh, to be better known, I think, excellent work. Yeah, he's he's, he's leading the charge for for, for this kind of uh, this kind of work, and, yeah. and again, hopefully, more people will become yeah. familiar with this and, and be able to to you know contextualise more more widely. Um, yeah. I mean, this is it, it's it's something again. I think you've shown in the book is is we know an awful lot about this, but there's so much work to be done, and this this whole field it's just so fascinating what can be opened up. Well, well, that's right. Of course, the challenge when you're uh, writing a book of, of this kind um, and trying to cover you know, the whole world and, and, and the whole uh, time period, uh, of, of course, that, that, that does present quite a few challenges. Uh, <laughs> uh, most of all, what to leave out, uh, uh, what, what to put in, because you have to be very, very, very selective. Mm. And um, I think that uh, making those decisions was one of the toughest parts of of writing i mean this is a book that took seven years of writing and wow, you know, gosh. years before mm. then of, of thinking uh but the a lot of the uh the time on the writing was making sure or trying to make sure that i wasn't just putting information down on a page i, I was telling a story the big story of the evolution of the genre but also the individual stories of uh, various individual authors that i felt mm. cast light on the uh, way that crime fiction has has grown over the years and mm. and the, the themes that you find and and the other thing i, I was very keen on and we've already touched on this with wilkie collins and gillian flynn but i'm very very uh wedded to the idea of connections and, and unexpected mm. It's a bit like a, a detective, uh, you know. <laughs> uh, where where do the clues take us? Uh, and and so one of the things I was keen to do was to find a way of uh, bringing to the reader's attention wherever I could the the links between, let's say, Conan Doyle and Paul Rosenhain, or Conan Doyle and the the Japanese writers. Mm. Which I, and these writers who, who have admired him over the years and, and many, many other connections. And, and in effect, uh, implicitly to say to readers, just because you like uh, Raymond Chandler, say, it doesn't mean you can't like Freeman Wills Cross. Mm. Uh, and Dashiell Hammett reviewed uh, uh, some of the Golden Age writers quite favourably. People forget that. Uh, they, they get wedded to the stereotypes of the American hard-boiled story versus the uh, the classic detective story, and I, and I I think that first of all they're not opposites, mm -hmm. and secondly uh, there is much to be gained and much pleasure to be had from from both of them. So so part of the challenge, of course, was trying to convey all this, but to do it in a in a readable and non hectoring way that, <laughs> the, uh, that was why it took seven years to, uh, to it, really. <laughs> one thing that you you really do do exceptionally well in this is that you you sort of mark the epochs and the and the moments of change the big significant changes and um one of the things that uh, uh you bring out are all these sort of rivals of Sherlock Holmes as, the, as they've been referred mm. to in in different times 
they seem to be sort of echoes or, 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 or um, they seem to be sort of detectives with a thing, you know, whether it's Dorrington being <laughs> a criminal as well, or it's uh, Martin Hewitt being almost an, uh, you know, an exact opposite of, yeah. but the, yeah. the, it doesn't seem to be that that's the next epoch. They, they just seem to be echoes of something successful and the next big change comes later. Yes, I, I think that is absolutely right. Certainly, it's the way that I see it. So, 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 so I think it's it's right for sure. Uh, because, as as you rightly say, in effect, uh, the majority of those writers were looking for a, a gimmick, a, you mm. know, a USP for their detective. And sometimes, with the inferior writers, they 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 just stayed with that gimmick, and and that was it. So. So if it's somebody who can lip read, or it's somebody who's <laughs> blind, or what, whatever it, what, whatever it might be. Um, but of course, the better writers will always try to do something more. The better mm. writers are always the more ambitious ones, and so you did get uh, uh, those writers who who would have the uh, the gimmick, but but they would try to do something with the story and the character that that uh, that offered a bit more than just a rehash of, uh, mm. of Sherlock. And so you see it a little bit in the stories of Max Caradus, the blind detective who's played by Ernest Brahma. You see it more with the Father Brown stories, Chesterton, mm. which we've mentioned, because Chesterton was, was a fine writer and he was very thoughtful. And so he saw the, uh, the what room type puzzle as uh, something that played into his love of paradox and the making of ironic points about human nature and society. And this, I think, is really why the Father Brown stories live on, in you know, including in, on daytime television in rather an unrecognisable way. Yes. But, uh, but, but, um, but that he, he took the idea of the interesting priest detective and, and he did something with it that was, uh, that was very creative and, and impressive. But I would agree that this didn't in itself amount to some... Uh, uh, substantial new epoch. It was it was rather an evolution of of something that Doyle had inspired. Mm. Yes, I mean the one that always gets associated, I think, closely linked with Conan Doyle is um, Austin Freeman's yes. Doctor Thorndike, of course, <laughs> yes. which has always felt to me like an, a, a very close echo, you know, coming from similar kind of roots. Although there is, you know, quite a lot of innovation in there as well. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and and I, I, I suppose with with Austin Freeman, well, first of all, he, he was admirable in terms of the authenticity at the mm. time of uh, some of the storylines. So, so if if you read a story, a very good story from 1930, Mr. Potomac's Oversight, which which mm. I, I don't actually talk about in the book, but but there, there's a there's a great plot idea in there that you couldn't have today because of scientific advance, but at the time. <laughs> time it, it was it was fine and and he was he was very reliable in that respect and as with mr Potomac and and the earlier stories in the singing bone he did do something fresh with the inverted story yes the same things mm. from the point of view of the murderer mm. and so so whilst he was a scientific writer very much in the tradition of Conan Doyle I, I see him as a pretty major figure because yeah. he, he he did new stuff with, with mm. that raw material. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. I mean, do, do you think that this sort of background, Martin, with, with uh, Conan Doyle brought to Holmes a, 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 a character elements from from Doyle's own professional background, i.e., the, you know, being a doctor. So you, you've got the, this, what you could perhaps call the, the diagnostics of crime. Yeah. But you've also got things like the case book of Sherlock Holmes. It sounds medical. You, you, you've got the fact that Holmes is a consulting detective, again, yeah. tying into the medical background. And that's where, where the, you've, you've, you've got a degree of professionalism with, with Holmes. But then you've got the amateur side of Holmes with, with the, the crime detection side against the police. He's, I, he's liberated because because he's he's not part of the professional police force or yeah. mm. in his own way. He can do things that the police can't, and he can break mm. the law in the way that the police should not. As Lestrade says, I think it's in the Bruce Partington plan. No wonder you get the results we can't get. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We we have the moonstone where we have a professional detective, Sergeant Cuff. 
Yeah. And do you think without Holmes, the the, 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 the the genre might have developed in a different way with the professional being more central, which happens later on? It, it is possible, although there is a little bit in even in the Moonstone of Franklin Blake as a sort of amateur detective. With so, the detective so I think that, yeah, uh, absolutely. Um, uh, that's a wonderful line, isn't it? Detective Beaver. Uh, so, so I, I, I think Better Edge is a, is a great character. So, so I, I think that that there is something in that that the sheer uh, uh, success. Of homes, not just in terms of commercial popularity, but also in terms of artistic achievement, mm. is always going to be hugely, hugely influential because that, that's the nature of, of things that people see something that works and you know they want more of it and they want to they want to slice of it for themselves. Yes. If, if in, the, in the same line of business as publishers or writers, so that yeah, that's the way that things are and and always will be, I, I, I guess. But um, without Holmes, well, it's, it's hard to contemplate a world without Holmes, isn't it? Yes. But if, if, if we try for a moment, I, I think that perhaps things would have progressed broadly as they have done, mm. but there would have been a loss of impetus. Yeah, you know, Sherlock Holmes, apart from anything else, gave the detective story uh, a fantastic uh, push uh, uh, because... If you think of Dupin, early 1840s, then we get Wilkie Collins with uh, uh, the sensation novels in the 1860s. Mm. But, but the detective story didn't really take off in a big way. Yeah, Sheridan Le Fanu wrote a few books that, that were good, and, and others mm. wrote, wrote good books. But it didn't really take off until Sherlock came along. And mm. so it was that impetus apart from all the other things that, that made a big difference, I think. Mm-hmm. We were talking a bit before then about your sort of the, the next epoch. So if, if, if Conan Doyle and Sherlock Holmes mark one, where's the next big shift, do you think? Well, to me, it comes after the First World War and the, the explosion of interest in, in uh, uh, what we now see as uh, class detective fiction. Mm. And, and the... The taking on a stage of this this concept of fair play that we were talking about, as I say, mm. I think Conan Doyle demonstrated how the deductions were arrived at. Mm. But as as we know, the Sherlock Holmes stories are predominantly short stories. The Chesterton Father Brown stories are all short stories. The mm. short story is the dominant form. Mm. Um, things changed after the First World War. The 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 novel. Uh, became more popular. There were all kinds of social and commercial reasons for that. But one of the, and of course, novels were written b- b- before then. But but they became dominant in the detective genre. And one of the things that changed as a result, I think, was that the extra length of the novel enabled the author to develop fair play by putting the clues into the text. So mm. giving the reader a chance to play Sherlock Holmes mm. or Poirot or, or whoever mm. uh, and solve the mystery. And fair play became a very important thing as far as the golden age writers and readers and publishers were, were concerned. And I think that that change, uh, which is, is most smart at, at in the aftermath of the First World War, was was a hugely significant development. Plus, you had Trent's last case just before the yeah. First World mm-hmm. War, which was very, very influential. The kind of catalyst. Austin Freeman had started writing uh, before the uh, First World War, but he was never really a specialist in fair play. He was more, <laughs> as, as you've mentioned, in the Holmes tradition, mm. because because we don't have access to Doctor Thorndike's uh, uh, immense. Uh, uh, expertise, uh, so you can see, uh, you know, a few leaves and and tell you that, that yeah, you wouldn't find those leaves anywhere else. But <laughs> right. yeah, there's a little estuary. Uh, uh, so, so I think that this commitment to fair play in terms of challenging the reader to solve mystery, making it an interactive experience, mm. was really essentially a fresh development 
after the First World War. Again, you'd, you'd had competitions for just men in the early years of, of, of the Wallace. Uh, he famously uh, uh, ran a competition. Uh, <laughs> uh, who, who can solve the mystery? And his, his problem was lots of people solve the mystery and he'd not put a limit on the number of people who were eligible. Yes. To <laughs> he was nearly bankrupt as a result. But, uh, uh, that, that, that was a lesson. <laughs> so, so you you have, as you always do, you you have uh, things going on beforehand, but but really it was after the First World War when when the Golden Age mm. uh, story and the Golden Age novel uh, mm. proper, because I, I I do think this point about novel versus short stories is significant. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's a really, really good point. I think, and um, I think you 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 rightly make point in the book about even Conan Doyle's Sherlock Holmes novels. You know, possibly with the exception of Sign of Four, they they mm. do have structural. I don't know. You don't want to call them issues because you don't want to give them those <laughs> criticisms as such. But <laughs> but you know, Sherlock Holmes is off stage for a long time in Hound of the Baskervilles, and yes. and to a to a post war reader, I think that would be a bit more of a struggle than yeah. necessarily it would have been at the time. I mean, the other the other um, thing I think that you bring out in in the book of, in the post war era is the development of you know, the the sort of evolving life of the um, the detective themselves. I think you bring out this in in the case of Peter Whimsey in particular, yeah. Yeah. and this this notion that the the character changes all the, over time. We were, we're used to regarding mm. Holmes and Watson as being sort of pickled in aspic in <laughs> in eighteen ninety five. And yeah. um, but actually, you get that. That's the other. That's another thing that's happening. Um, perhaps a bit more slowly, but uh, marks marks another change. I think. Oh, oh, very much so. And, and again, if we think of Poirot and Hastings, that they, they, they were very much, as, as as you well know, very much <clears throat> modelled in terms of their relationship on on Holmes and Watson, <clears throat> and, and certainly the early short, short stories are very, very. Uh, influenced by Conan Doyle, mm. uh, but, but but are inferior uh, in in the context of Christie's work generally, mm. um, and of course later she she realizes that Hastings is a constraint, so she sends him off to ranch <laughs> in, in the Argentine. Uh, so uh, so, so that, that's almost the end of him in in the Poirot series. But Poirot doesn't really develop, whereas with Whimsy, he too. Is initially conceived as this upper class, rich, uh, uh, erudite, knowledgeable, glamorous, uh, mm. perfect uh, piece of wish fulfillment, really. Bertie Wooster, but but with a brain. <laughs> yes. uh, kind of and 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 then, um, because Sayers is an ambitious and thoughtful writer, uh, a novelist, it it dawns on her that that you can do more. And so when she writes in, in her introduction to her first anthology that, that love interest, and she criticizes Austin Freeman for this, <laughs> uh, love interest is, is a bad thing. You know, a couple of years later, she's, she's uh, uh, changing her tune completely. And Harriet Vane uh, comes mm. on the scene. And Whimsy changes as a character. Yeah. Uh, uh, very uh, dramatically, really. And then you have the ongoing... Uh, Will she, won't she? Kind of uh, thing going on with Harriet Vane, and eventually, the, you know, Gordy Knight. There is the proposal. Of course, it's in Latin, but because uh, <laughs> it's Dorothy I'll say. But but but, and then they get married and uh, have children and so on. So so it it really is a big change from from what we've known previously with uh, mm. with Holmes and Watson. I, I do think that. Sayers deserves a lot of credit for that, that uh, she was really a pioneer in this field. One or two other people had done it. Her friend Helen Simpson had done it, uh, mm. uh, sort of, in, in the first uh, book she wrote with Clemens Dane, and to Sir John. But, but by and large, it was Sayers who really showed what could be done with the development of the detective character. And she was doing... Of course, we, we get glimpses in the later home stories of, mm. of, of her a broader characterization mm. but uh, it's of a very different order from from what we see in in uh, whimsy and, and what we see all the time today yeah and and i think that you know that nicely takes us to this sort of point of the later adventures of sherlock holmes because you know 
Sherlock Holmes becomes a period piece. I mean, he he doesn't really, <laughs> with the exception of a couple of stories, he's he's really before sort of nineteen o three, and yeah. these stories are being written in the nineteen twenties, and crime yeah. fiction's moved on enormously. Yeah. And I just wonder how you how it compares because I mean we're not quite at hard boiled yet, but we're right on the on the on the cusp of it. Um, in well nineteen twenty seven. Yeah. Um, when Shoska yeah. Old Place comes out, yeah, so. yeah. yeah that, that's that, that's very true, and it, it's 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 remarkable, really, when when one thinks that uh, he, he was writing Sherlock Holmes stories for many more years after uh, the great <laughs> yes. uh, hiatus than, than than before. That that's very striking, I think, and and of course there are all sorts of uh, reasons, including commercial reasons, why <laughs> why why that was the case. But um, of course, what what he he tries to do in very uh, limited ways is to develop the character and the relationship. You know, mm. Watson gets this glimpse of, of a tender side, uh, but it, but it's pretty brief. Um, and of course, it, it it's often been said that you know, uh, was it Baron Gould who said you know he may not have been killed when he he, he plunged into the falls. He was never quite the same man afterwards. I think that, but yeah, that, I, I, I understand <laughs> that. But having said that, I I've always enjoyed the later stories i i would accept that overall they don't come up to the standard of the early stories but but how many stories do like yeah. let's be yeah. honest think the first yeah, that first half doesn't absolutely brilliant. he yeah. wrote them in in a very short space of time you know, one after another they just had this this fire of creative energy and imagination and, and the, the, you know, the stories were quite brilliant but you do get later ones the I, I've, I've always liked the three Gary Deads I, I know it's a bit mm. of a, <laughs> uh, a rerun of, uh, of an earlier story but but even so it, it, it appeals to me that one I, I, I just love the name Gary Dead apart from anything else yes. but uh, uh, that's one that's always uh, uh, always worth rereading mm. I've, mm. I've got I, I think the first short story I ever read was The Lion's Mane. So hmm? I've got a really? Yes. Yeah. Uh, it was in a, a collection uh, that, that I read and it was the first story. So uh, so that sticks in my mind. Um, and it was after that that I got the, you know, I, I had it as a Christmas present as a, as a small boy, the, the collected short story. So <laughs> I read those and then, then I went on to the, the other uh, John Murray omnibus, the collected longest story, mm. and, and then this Thor Bridge, which again has a plot that mm. is uh, slightly derivative, but but in itself uh, influenced the plot of a later Marjorie Allingham story. Yes, of so, course. Uh, quite a, quite a quite a strong story, I think. So so I, I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't dismiss the later mm. stories, even if inevitably they don't have. Quite the original art and fashion. Sure. He, he he does move with the times though with this, which is interesting. With with the the case book, where you do get these kind of slightly more adult, yeah, Baron more harder edged <laughs> stories yeah, yeah. Com, coming up in the case book, and yeah. he, he's with this 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 greater freedom for writers that's coming after the First World War, and obviously yeah. there's been this massive shock the first world war has caused to the system and and you know death on a massive scale and life is 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 a darker thing people are struggling more and this is reflected even in the sherlock holmes stories which still have this Indeed. element of nostalgia uh, and it, it's always kind of fascinated me when you look at the um the original strand versions of these stories with the illustrations by howard elcock mm. where the, the 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 characters are drawn as 1920s characters even yeah, though the yeah. stories are set, yes. you know, in, in in the late Victorian Edwardian period, there's still this almost the, the magazine driving to say these stories are still relevant, even with yeah. all the new detectives. Holmes is still the yeah. detective; he's still the one to 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 read. So all that element comes in, and 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 you almost buy into this idea that the case book is inferior. Then you go and reread them. And you yeah. think actually, there's there's an awful lot going on in these stories which is worth investigating and worth reading. Well, 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 that is true, and and I, I think that um, the the explanation is that he, he was actually a very good writer, <laughs> yeah, particularly in the home stories, I, I would say. But but generally, he, mm. he is a good writer. The I, I think the thing about Sherlock Holmes uh, uh, as a character and, and the idea of the 
the crime and detective stories is that it, it gave him permission to liberate the darker side of his imagination mm. uh, in, in a way that, uh, you know, I, I like the Brigadier Gerard stories, uh, I, I like the Challenger stories, but uh, uh, I, I think that there's something about the, the, the darker side of life that, that, that really freed his thinking. Mm. And and you get it in in the stories, and and his prose is is excellent. The and, and the conjuring up of atmosphere and macabre incidents, you know, the engineer's thumb and all all that kind of thing. Mm. It, it's it's very very evocative, and that I I think is one more of of the ingredients that that, that goes into the mix that makes these such uh, timeless stories. Mm-hmm. I think that nicely brings us back to something we said right at the beginning about the gothic and sensation novels, because that's it's almost like that tradition is being brought forward all the time by by Conan Doyle and his yeah. writing. And mm-hmm. I do I, I agree with you, Paul. I think there's you know particularly I, I'm always amazed at the illustrious client and the story of Baron Gruner. You know that could only really be written in the in the 1920s. Mm-hmm. Really, mm-hmm. Um, yeah. it's such a such a dark topic. Um, yeah. One of the things I'm really interested in now is the sort of continuing legacy uh, of Conan Doyle, if we come on to that now. Yeah. And, mm. you know, we mentioned at the outset that you're the current president of the Detection Club. And yes. that, um, mm-hmm. uh, you know, we mentioned some of your predecessors, Cheston and Sayers in here. And and where do you, would do you, do you see Conan Doyle's place um, among the sort of your contemporary um writers of crime fiction now i mean is is conan doyle still a figure that people will will go back to now or has time moved on well time always moves on but uh but that doesn't mean to say that conan doyle isn't still not just respected for what he achieved <laughs> uh which is of course extraordinary but but an, an inspirational figure because even even now you know in in, in living memory, you know, Colin Dexter with Morse and Lewis, a sort of reincarnation mm-hmm. of, mm-hmm. In, in, in a particular way of, of Holmes and Watson, uh, almost immediately after uh, Dew and Simmons, another of my uh, illustrious predecessors as mm-hmm. president of the club, uh, more or less declared the detective story dead. Then, you know, mm-hmm. then, then, then along comes Colin and kind <laughs> of knocks that theory somewhat on the head. So, so I think that that continuing influence is is there and and again you you see it um i i think right at the moment we of course we live in particularly uncertain times by any standards and you know, many parallels are being drawn with the 20s and 30s uh in terms of ages of uncertainty and, and i think that there's, there's little doubt that people are going back to the to the classics they're going back to the uh idea of the great detective and of course inevitably if you do that you'll go back to to Sherlock Holmes and one of the ideas that I I push out in in the life of crime is 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 this that it is often been said uh, and, and with a germ of truth that, that the classic detective story is about the restoration of order to a disrupted mm. society but but I, I I see I see things more broadly I, I, mm. I think that uh, I, I don't think that theory accounts for Patricia Highsmith. I don't <laughs> even think it accounts for, for Sherlock Holmes in a lot mm. of the stories. I, mean, mm. I think that, um, yeah, I, I think I mentioned in the book that, you know, criminals get away with it and, <laughs> you know, Sherlock does bad things. It, it, it's, it's, uh, it, it's a bit more complex than that. And, and what I, I, I think is that the crime story is very often, if not always, a fictional uh, way of uh, showing people facing uncertainties in life and trying to deal with them. Sometimes mm. they resolve them successfully, sometimes they don't. Mm. Uh, and sometimes the uncertainties uh, result in something terrible. Uh, and I think that that is yeah, the, the question that's often asked. Why, why do people read detective stories? I, I think that... Uh, Part of the answer lies in this that, that we're seeing in, in fiction, whether it's Sherlock or, or whether it's uh, uh, Patricia Highsmith or whether it's Christie or whether it's anybody else uh, today. Mm. Uh, I, I think that you're seeing a, 
uh, a story about life's uncertainties and unpredictabilities. Very often, uh, because crime is involved, something very serious and, and threatening by definition is happening. Uh, and, and then you're looking to see how the characters address it. And, and when things are tough in our real lives, I think that we find not just comfort mm. uh, from reading these books. I, I think there is comfort uh, from the likes of Agatha Christie, uh, famously, amongst others, and, 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 and you would say Richard Osman today. Mm. Uh, but but, but, but you, you get something else as well. And I, I, I think that uh, uh, you will have guessed uh, that, that I am a, a devotee of uh, crime fiction, it's all its many forms. I, I, I think it has something to offer anybody who's who's willing to uh, uh, look at it with an open mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and I say that, that with these connections, you know, I think it's exciting to think you can start with Sherlock and you can you can wander off from there into many <laughs> different directions. But you can also start from. Uh, Richard Osman and, and work back to Sherlock. It, it's yeah, the, 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 mm. these connections work both ways. So, so I think that uh, uh, Conan Doyle's future at the uh, at the top of the tree is uh, is uh, as far as I'm concerned assured. Mm. Yeah, I, with with the life of crime, Martin, it, it it the the approach that you've taken in your writing seems to be different to a certainly to an academic approach um in that yeah. it, it's very chatty yeah. you're absorbing information without you know sometimes i i find you you mention a lot to bloody murder by julian simmons mm. uh, which came out in the early 70s and and simmons at time can be at times can be a bit uh, acerbic and 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 yes. difficult yes. um whereas you, you seem to be deliberately avoiding that and yes. and 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 looking at things in a in a critical way but without being heavily critical if you know what i mean from what i'm saying well that. exactly yes that, that's that's very much my belief and um uh much as i admire bloody murder and, and i do um I, I wanted to take a different approach, mm. and, and I wanted to take a different approach in a couple of in a couple of ways. First of all, although as I say in the introduction, you, know, you, you can work out my opinions about a lot of things. <laughs> I, I wanted to present, uh, perhaps because I've I've been trained as a as a lawyer, I wanted to present both mm. sides of of a lot of the arguments. So I've included in the book uh, uh, a lot of references. Uh, to opinions, views that, that, that I very much don't share, just mm. just to show that there's another way of looking at a particular author or a particular book or, or whatever it might be. Because I was very, very keen that um, I, 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 I was consciously presenting a lot of information to readers, but I didn't want to thrust a particular view down their throat, other mm. than the fact that I think crime fiction is great. Uh, <laughs> but, but apart from that, uh, I, I wanted people to make up their own minds uh, about books and authors. And, and let's face it, in any event, they, they will do. So you should embrace that mm. uh, and, and encourage it. So, so I was keen to try to be relatively even-handed in the way that I, I present the material. I've, I've not declared the obituary of, uh, of forms of fiction in the way that mm. Julian did it. Uh, mistakenly, in my view, the yes. Golden Age uh, novel. Uh, I, yeah, I just think that that was a misjudgment. But, um, but, but yeah, we all make misjudgments. But um, because I wanted to to take this approach, I, I was faced with the challenge that, you know, I'm presenting a lot of information uh, it's mm. bound to be a big book. You know, the synopsis, I, I told the publishers, it's going to be 160,000 words, finishes at about a quarter of a million words, so it's very, very <laughs> big book. And uh, they were very, very kind and tolerant <laughs> uh, when the manuscript arrived. <laughs> and, and I did that in a couple of ways. Firstly, it was very important to me that the individual chapters should each tell a story linked to a yes. vignette about a, one particular author, some incident in their their lives or careers, uh, and then then move on from there in, in a variety of different ways. I didn't have a template for it, and I, I do it in different ways throughout the book. But then 
at the end of the chapter, the whole set of end notes, not, mm. not, they're not footnotes, but they're, they're very, very discursive and, and they, mm. they take the, the reader in, in lots and lots of different directions. They contain a lot of information and, and fun stuff, trivial yeah. things that I yeah. find interesting that I hope other people find interesting. And you don't have to read the end notes at the same time. I, I was conscious that different people would have different ways of reading the book. Some would read it straight through, some would just read the main chapter, some would dip into it. So what I was trying to do as far as one can is to try to cater for different approaches to the book because I did and do want it to have longevity as a book. Mm. That's something mm. I aim for with my fiction and, and with my non-fiction. And so to try to achieve that that bold or, or <laughs> optimistic <laughs> ambition, I, I, I tried to write it in a novelistic way. It's very much not an academic book, despite all the references. There are tons and tons of references and mega bi bibliography and, and all that kind mm. of thing. But it's not meant to be a scholarly book. It's meant to be a book that, although it tells the reader stuff, it is meant to entertain and engage mm. in a way that a novel does, hopefully, uh, or a short story. So it's meant to appeal to people. And I, and I like it when people tell me they, you know, they start reading one chapter and they think, oh, well, maybe I'll read another one. And, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and yeah, that, that's very gratifying because that, that of course, is, is, is what, what one dreams of as, mm. as, as a writer. That, that's what you're trying to do. You can't always achieve it. You can't achieve it for every reader, but, but you're trying to achieve it. And um, I, I think telling the story of crime fiction, telling the individual stories of the ups and downs of the lives of these writers, and there are, there are many downs as well as many ups, even, <laughs> even with the greatest writers, um, and trying to give a rounded picture of the writing life. Uh, was uh, something that was very important to me because it's something that fascinates me. I wanted to share that fascination with uh, with people who read the book. So, so that was the objective uh, mm. when I set out to write it. And that, of course, is yet another reason why it took me seven years to write it. <laughs> well, I do think the objective has been achieved. I mean, it's incredibly engaging work. And I mm. think the, the, the end notes I very much appreciate for, um, you know, for all the connections made. I mean, in, in fact, it said that, you know, the difference between a novice and an expert is the number of connections that they can make between <laughs> things. So I don't know what the answer is for an expert who makes many more expert <laughs> connections than anyone could expect. You need to develop a new category, I think. Um, so, I mean, it's been fantastic to talk to you today, Martin, and to mm. learn more about it. I'll put a link to Life of Crime on the uh, uh, website, and we heartily encourage everybody to to pick up a copy. Perfect Absolutely. Christmas reading, I would be saying. Um <laughs> And, uh, and thank you a lot for your, for your time today. Well, thanks very much indeed. And, and bear in mind that if all else fails, it's such a big book, it does double as a murder weapon. <laughs> <laughs> and on that note. <laughs> <laughs> thanks, Martin. Thanks, thanks Martin. Well, it's lovely to talk to Martin today. Extremely mm. interesting conversation. Um, we could probably have gone on for another hour with him. I'm these. sure. Um, but uh, yeah, the, the 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 book is is great, um, and I, I recommend it to everyone out there. Um, even if your interest is just Sherlock Holmes, give it a go um, yeah. because you will you will learn you'll actually learn more about Holmes. You'll learn, definitely learn about the the, the context and and. Uh, the the influence of Holmes and Doyle um, throughout mm. you, you know the, the 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 afterlife of of of, of crime fiction in the twentieth and twenty first centuries yeah absolutely re recommended yeah and it was lovely to hear about how Conan Doyle is still regarded in in the uh, illustrious circles of the Detection Club and the Crime mm. Writers Association. Mm. Mm -hmm. So uh, what have we got on the podcast next time, Paul? Next time, we're actually going back to Sherlock Holmes mm -hmm. and we'll be wrestling with the final problem. <laughs> wrestling, indeed. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for listening. If you would like to check out the show notes, they're on doingsofdoyle.com. And if you'd like to become a patron, uh, you can find out more at patreon.com forward slash doingsofdoyle or go to the website uh, and find the PayPal link. So until next time, it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Goodbye.
You see, said Lord Peter, uh, balancing a piece of duck on his fork and frowning, it's only in Sherlock Holmes and stories like that that people think things out logically. Ordinarily, if somebody tells you something out of the way, you just say, by Jove, or how sad, and leave it at that. 